So we've uh, had this journey as a bit of a, a, a belated uh, finish to it, but here we are. We've set up some of the basics of. Um, okay, we've had this journey um, where so we've uh, now finishing up. So we've had this journey as a bit of a, a, a belated. Uh, sorry. Uh, we're finishing up a, a crash course in Durham theory, and we're going to finally get where we wanted, um, which is uh, talking about the Whitehead there, the integral. Uh, Durham theory is uh, something where you're looking at uh, calculus and multivariable calculus and just, quote unquote, the right framework to do multivariable calculus. And it turns out, and we saw this last time, that it's also has a lot to say about deformation and in particular producing <laughs> deformation invariant homotopy invariant quantities um and in fact to this day it's uh, a quote unquote cutting edge tool i find it uh, absolutely it is absolutely essential in uh some of my results in some of the biggest results that are in my area resolving some questions that i posed you use drum uh, integration so um, we talked last time about um, things like degree as well as Durham cohomology today. And we, we also started to talk about linking number. Um, and we're going to see that the Whitehead integral geometrically makes a lot of sense as in terms of linking number, but you need Durham theory to develop its uh, properties. So let's recall some things about degree. So suppose we've got a map from man one manifold to another of the same dimension, dimension D or something like that. And omega is a volume form. Um, and what we mean by that is um, the integral over N, and this is on N, integral over N of omega is one. Uh, unit volume form. And then what you do, the degree of F is by definition, I'm gonna pull back omega, now it's a form over M and integrate it over M. Um, and and uh, you know the theorem is that that is an integer. Um, and to prove this is an integer, Well, first we show it's um, independent of choice of omega. And of course, it's also independent of um, uh, homotopy, independent of F up to homotopy. You can deform F and you're going to get the same number. And then what we can do is we can choose omega to be um, schematically, if I've got N here, I've got some point P, I take a neighborhood and my form is gonna be a, a Dirac form, a bump form, a Gaussian centered at P, that kind of thing, with total integral one, of course. And then what you, um, what you get, then for this omega, integral over M F upper star omega, ends up being the sum over um, y, which are um, which map to p, which are pre-images of p, of um, plus or minus one. Um, it's like a sign of the determinant uh, obtained from the derivative of f at the point y. All right, um, so this is, one of the main places we got last time. I wanted to just have these characters in front of this, us. I also wanted to indicate that here's an alternate proof. Um, when you look at the right-hand side, there's an alternate proof of homotopy invariance. And this is not only a good, um, just brings another geometric idea and brings to me another tool to understand what 
some Duram theoretic integrals actually are doing. Um, and what you can do is, um, uh, so I've got my M, N is here, here's my P. I look at pre-images of P, so here they are. And they have signs, so maybe it's plus, minus, plus. And through a homotopy, M cross I, Uh, I can also look at the pre-image of P and, you know, quote, unquote, bad things can happen, but for your favorite functions in general, this P is, is one dimension less. Um, and, and so it's pre-image in M cross I is going to be, um, or well, it's actually D dimensions less. It's going to be D dimensions less than that. Well, it's pre-image is going to be a one manifold. So in other words, a, a, a union of curves and intervals and the curves, um, curves which are intervals or circles, um, the intervals or curves have to have opposite signed um, ends. And so what you get is um, if you look at it, then the, the signed count of both sides is equal, and that's because, well, every curve either has no endpoints, one of those circles, so it's not contributing to either end, or it's got two endpoints in the same end, and they give a plus or and minus canceling pair, so that contributes zero to the degree, or their endpoints are um, on, on uh, opposite sides, in which case I've got a plus one and a minus on the other, and the way we set things up with um, Stokes's theorem, that would actually mean that they would contribute the same to degree because I'm supposed to use the uh, opposite orientation at the other end. So, um, so yeah, it's 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 one of my favorite perspectives uh, in in topology uh, for this degree um, is is using the fact that the that a interval or a curve has two ends actually gives me a bijective uh, argument that these numbers are the same on both sides. And um, so even though we use Stokes theorem to give a per perfectly good proof, there's an additional bit of intuition um, that I like to use in some cases. Well, any form, any volume form, is a sum of um, these, you know, small supported forms. You know, we take we take our volume form. Um, and and just look at it in some patchwork of things that um, sum to one. And, and now each one of those, I can apply this. Um, it's not going to be a, a, a true volume form. It's not going to have integral one. It's going to have integral some small fraction. But for each of those fractions, I can see this sort of um, equality on both sides through the um, homotopy invariance proof I, I just gave. So I often more, you know, um, we can use this. So these, so locally supported forms give a key case. In fact, if something's true for locally supported forms and it behaves well under addition, then you've got it in general. All right, so that's reviewing a bit about um, degree. Now let's go to uh, linking number. So for linking number, um, Uh, 
we had, um, let's set some notation. We have two maps from circles into R3. Their images are disjoint. And what we used this to do was produce Uh, it gives us uh, some other piece of data that we can produce from it. Namely, we can look at the, instead of looking at points on one or the other circle, I can take a pair of points, one on the first circle, one on the second circle. So whereas disjoint union is just two circles sitting there, this ends up being a torus because I'm taking the product. Um, I can produce from that, uh, I can subtract one from the other and I get an uh, element of R3 and that's not zero because these are disjoint. And then I can project to the two sphere, okay? So um, uh, by taking the, um, the, the any vector in R3 minus zero and dividing it by its length. So this composite I'll call gamma for Gauss. Um, and really what you're doing explicitly, uh, gamma of say two S and T is gonna uh, be um, L one of T minus L two of S over its length. And then the linking number is just the degree of gamma. And so, This number, the this um, this map happens to be now a map from a torus, which is a two-dimensional manifold, to a two-sphere, which is also a two-dimensional manifold, and so it has a degree. And so you can, you know, that's going to be just the integral over S one cross S one of um, gamma upper star omega for omega volume form, and you can choose a rotationally symmetric um, form on the two sphere. And this ends up having a fairly simple, I gave an alternate version last time. Um, you're gonna double integral over, you can really think of it as a square. Because um, for integration purposes, I can cover the, the torus with a square. There's a little overlap, but it doesn't change the integral. Um, S and T are just numbers between zero and one. And what I'm gonna do is take the derivative of the first link um, at that component at S and the derivative of the second link component at T. And then I'm also gonna take um, The difference, and then I'm going to take that determinant, and then I'm going to divide that by the length um, between things as a sort of normalization cubed. Okay, and this is of course just dsdt. Exercise. This is equal to um, the thing that we were talking about last time. Um, the, the thing last time was closer to Durand theory, but you can um, you can show that they agree. Okay. Um, but what we can also do instead, um, as we just did, but choose so equals here's the the omega equals the symmetric evenly spread volume form on S2, or choose omega to be um, on S2, that's the, the unit directions in R3, I'm gonna choose it to be concentrated super close to the um, point zero, zero, 001, okay? And then if you think about it, um, Then this integral um, is 
will only have contribution when um, when L2 is over L1. So then if I'm looking down, I'm gonna see either um, L2 like this, moving over L1, or um, L2 like this, looking moving over L1. If I change my perspective right, I can think of these as, um, you know, move my head and I see L L2 is over L1 and either going northwest to southeast or, or vice versa. Um, and you assign, um, you know, one of these is plus one and one of these is minus one. And what you get in the end, uh, because we've used this form, uh, which again, it just means that even though I'm integrating over all possible S and T's, all possible places where um, I've got a point on the first link component and the point on the second link component. Now this integral only cares about when the point on the second link component is over the point on the first link component. I'm just gonna count those um, because it's supposed to be a volume form, remember? So it's gonna give me a value of one or minus one every time. And, um, you know, so, so this, um, so this determinant that we've just written up here, I'll just write this here. So deduce that this is equal to a sum over crossings in a Z projection. Again, I'm looking down at the link from above of um, you know, plus or minus one, depending on, again, the, the, the picture. Um, here's the plus or minus one rules. So that's kind of remarkable. You can take derivatives and you have these small contributions as S and T go around the links, or you sort of Dirac form it and you're just getting a discrete count. And that's uh, that's part of the power of Durham theory. That's part of the essence of topology is, is these counts that have both discrete and continuous manifestations. This is entirely analogous to um, you. Uh, we did winding number as one of our first examples. So there's a, a d theta integral as you go around, um, and and that's going to give you the ultimately when you integrate d theta divide by two pi, depending on your definition of d, d theta, um, you're going to get the number of times you wind around the origin. Well, you can also count that by counting the number of times you cross the x-axis. Um, the positive x-axis alone, right? And you count those with signs so that if you cross it, you know, going up, that's a plus one. If you go, if you turn around and go back down, that's a minus one. Um, and, and those are also equal, again, through this flexibility and how you choose your, um, your volume form when you're doing this um, disintegration. Um, I really think of that as, uh, you know, the, the x-axis, positive x-axis is like a toll booth and the count is just going up uh, when we cross. Whereas d theta is like a continuous monitoring system. I don't even know if anybody does this, but you could put a GPS in people's cars and just as they drove around, you could, you know, collect a tax or something. So, um, so both work to count the same thing, but they've got a very different feel to them. Um, let me give yet another way, now that we see the crossing counts, so we see that the Gauss integral equals a crossing count. I'm going to give one other interpret, uh, equivalent definition, and this I'm not just doing this for, for, for laughs. The, this will be very useful for what else. Um, or, uh, and this doesn't, or once we have crossing counts, Here's another way to think about that crossing count. Um, so I'll just give you the, the formula, the linking number of a two component link is gonna be the number, all again, counted with signs of 
um, of a disk, I'll define this d sub one in a second, of a disk with a second component. Um, and I wanna look at their intersection. So where d1 is a choice of disk, Um, in R3, so that the boundary of D1 is my first link component. Okay. So let's prove that, um, or let's, of course, sketch the proof. The first step is to show that this is well-defined. That itself is, is interesting. Um, we made a choice of a D1. So here's my L1, here's my L2. Um, we make a choice of D1 whose boundary is, is the L1, but I could make a different choice maybe here, D1 prime. Um, and the claim is that I'm gonna get the same number. Um, and that ends up being uh, because, well, if you take both D1 and D1 prime, they're now making topologically, it's maybe not smooth, but topologically a sphere. So the count of D1 intersect L2 minus D2, intersect L2 ends up being the count of a two sphere, uh, which is the union of D1, union D2 along their, their boundary intersect L1. And that ends up being zero because, and again, there's some, some signs to pay attention to, but, but that's like, this is actually a generalization of the Jordan curve theorem that any two sphere in three space intersected with a curve in three space um, the curve comes in and then it has to leave again or vice versa or does it multiple times. But, but in any case, that's the same. And what you get is that the, um, ultimately the numbers of intersections with these bounding disks are, are the same. So then what you can do, um, you also have to prove that it's isotopy invariant. So this is the choice of D1. And there's also isotopy of L2. And what you do is you think about L2 here, it intersected D1 at some collection of points. And then if I isotop L2, um, as with degree, once again, um, Get my favorite picture that as we isotop L2, these intersections will sort of trace out some curves. And once again, curves either have both endpoints at the same end or no endpoints at all, or endpoints uh, at different ends. And these signed counts, these counts with pluses and minuses, end up being the same. Um, you also have to do isotopy of L1. And thus, you would have to um, show that you can make an isotopy of D1. And I'm going to leave that as an exercise. OK? Once we believe that you get an invariant, and, and now remember, a linking number has this crossing count formula, um, then we uh, choose D1 wisely. So I've got my L1 and my L2. And I'm going to choose my D1 to go straight up for a long. These are both compact. So I can go up above, cap things off however way I want here. 
but then the intersections of um, L1 with this thing, with this object, um, is also going to be, these are going to be points of L2 above L1. And so that's going to be the same count um, once you once you work out all the signs, which I am not. It takes as, about as much time. It probably takes longer to work out the signs than it does to just do things conceptually as we're doing here. Okay. We're gonna go one more place with this. We're gonna take this intersection uh, count and we're gonna express it back in terms of Durham theory. So lots of, lots of uh, amazing, important ideas packed into one lecture. That's what happens when you try to uh, finish off crash courses. So let me say more about tome forms. They're the general generalizations. Um, this is a, a little digression at the moment. They're the generalization of these um, bump forms that we used before. So instead of having a point and I've got some neighborhood of the point, um, and then I've got uh, omega, which is sort of um, supported there, I can also, take some submanifold. Um, so I often call this W. So instead of my N having a point, I can have a W in N. Um, and I take a neighborhood and really I wanna think about that neighborhood. It's, it's important that um, one of the main things you first prove in differential topology is that local up to local coordinates around any point in that W, I can really think of W being like a plane or a line inside of R3, something linear like that. And then I've got a good sense of my normal directions. It's called the normal bundle. And there's a form called tau of W. So it's, it's some kind of form that among other things, so let me, let me list its properties, so theorem, We can construct A, in fact, many. So that's actually a, a more of a bug than a feature. Many tau sub Ws so that, so what are, what are the main properties here? Um, so uh, tau sub W, Tau sub W is, um, so it's not omega, this is a submanifold W, is a differential form of degree whose degree is the dimension of N minus the dimension of W. Um, It then ends up that suppose the dimension of S plus the dimension of W is the dimension of N. In other words, dimension of S equals the degree of tau W. Then it, it happens that you can look at um, intersections and in some cases, um, that happen generically that you would always observe in nature in particular, um, S will intersect W in a finite collection of points that we can count. And that ends up being the integral over S of, um, of tau W. And, and I should really just say the pullback of tau W to S. Um, Another good property to know is that we can choose arbitrarily small support. That's so really think of like a delta function kind of thing. And then the other remarkable thing, I didn't draw my W with a bound. Well, its boundary was on N, but um, if, if W ends, think of a surface with a curve on its boundary or a curve with an endpoint, then, D of tau W is T 
tau of the boundary of W. And if the boundary of W is, is zero, this says that tau W is closed. Um, so, and again, this is a choice. In other words, there's many possible tau Ws, but this D of tau W satisfies all the defining properties which we want of any tau W, tau partial W. Okay. So um, what's a good example? And we kind of alluded to this in a different way before. Um, if N is R2 minus the origin and W is the positive X axis, then um, then this, this tau W, um, is an alternate to, to our d theta. It's going to be a one form because this is positive x axis is one dimensional, n is two dimensional. So w is a one form that when I integrate it along a curve, it's just going to count plus, plus, minus in this case. It's going to say, oh, this curve wound around twice. And again, the curve doesn't have to be a closed curve, but if it is, then this is going to be a good invariant. Um, the other fact that we, um, one more fact. Is that tau W wedge, suppose I've got a different submanifold tau V is a choice for W tau of w intersect v when they are transverse again. So this should also be listed above. Um, and this is remarkable. This says that all this calculus, remember all the work we did for exterior differentiation says, well, if you're in a setting where you can think of submanifolds and intersections, then all this Durham theory comes to counting intersections or, or value, you know, finding intersections. Um, so an example is for a surface, you can think of d theta one, d theta two, maybe d phi one, d phi two as things which wrap around these, but I could also take a bunch of curves, um, call it c one, c two, I don't know, m one and m two, And, and you would have things like, um, and again, what you, what you can do is you're measuring other curves by how they intersect this system of curves. This gets very close to, in fact, Poincaré's original envision for, for topology and, and how it works and what it's measuring. So you, you have this system and what this says is that, for example, you know, um, tau C1 wedge tau N1 is tau P for this point P, um, whereas tau C1 wedge tau C2 or tau M2 is zero, et cetera. So it gives you, um, these curves give you a way to, to get um, some Durham uh, representatives that, um, again, you can calculate with, we'll calculate with geometric thing. All right, so after that digression, we remember that our, our um, last definition of linking number was take your first link component, co-bound it and intersect it with, um, with the other uh, components. So now back to L1 and L2 a link and D1 and D2 if you wanted to, to be two co-boundings. Um, so there's another integral, but it's a very different integral. I'm gonna look at um, tau D1 um, and tau L2, their wedge is gonna reflect the intersection of D1 and D2, which I was counting before. 
these are forms, so I'm integrating them. But now this is over S3, right? And, and, and let's remember the original, the Gauss integral. is over S1 cross S1. So this is a very different kind of integral. Um, the Gauss integral took this link and made a, a map from a torus to a, a two sphere. This is taking the data of L1 and L2 and producing forms on S3, not on S2 or S1 cross S1. Um, but it ends up that these are the same. Um, so both have their auxiliary constructions, but the, they're, they're kind of different. Okay, believe it or not, we are ready to talk a bit about Whitehead's integral. And, and one thing to note about this last integral is that D1 is a choice. And so the, the tau D1 um, is, a, is a choice. And you could, you could also, by the way, um, this is d inverse tau l1 because of this last um, fact about um, the d tau w is tau of the boundary of w so the d of tau d1 since d of tau d1 is tau of the boundary of d1 which is l1 okay okay Let's talk about the Whitehead interval. And I wanted to, to give it some context first. So recall that, recall, I mean, you aren't experts at this, but um, let's recall that the Durham cohomology, which we said were of some manifold M, which were closed forms, those whose derivatives vanish, modulo those who have antiderivatives. Um, these were, uh, these ended up giving um, sort of homotopy um, measuring tools. homotopy invariant tools to measure maps from M to N. And M didn't, and M don't have to be the same dimension. I can, M can be a curve. Um, and let me make this N, not M. M can be a curve, N could be R2, and the form is measuring something about a curve. So um, degree, they end up being the same dimension, but they don't have to be the same dimension. But here's a fact um, that we've seen examples of. H in Durham of N equals zero for N bigger than the dimension of N. So Durham theory, as far as it's concerned, we don't, we don't have any, you, you wanna measure something from a higher dimensional thing to a lower dimensional thing. Sorry, we don't have anything for you. And so you might wonder, um, and this was sort of a conjecture, and this wasn't really an explicit conjecture. It's something everybody just assumed is true that in fact, there were no interesting uh, maps. The, the, there were no homo homotopy invariants to be had, that everything could be, um, say, related to a constant map. Between any two spaces, I can always map X to a point, a single point in Y, or M to a single point in N. Um, and in some cases, every other map can be deformed to be that kind of stupid map. And people, people thought that if I had a higher dimensional space and a lower dimensional space, uh, in fact, that could always be the case. Um, but but then the 1930s, it's around the time of quantum mechanics and, and arguably is strange, but to a very, very small set of people who could understand that this is strange, um, he considered a map from the three sphere to the two sphere. And I'm thinking of the three sphere 
as um, unit numbers and this is going to use uh, complex numbers um, uh, in essential way, the unit complex numbers in, in pairs of complex numbers. Um, and what we're going to do is I'm just going to take the quotient z2 over z1 and that's going to be in C union a point in infinity. But if I take the complex numbers and add a point in infinity, that's exactly a two sphere. And what uh, Hopf said about this eta is there does not exist a homotopy. So a way to take S3 and deform it in some family um, given by say the 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 unit the the interval from zero to one, where um, I start off with eta and I end with a constant map. So um, let me give you a, a, a an idea of proof. So the hop map, um, I'm tempted to just go on to, to Google now. Maybe I'll, I will at the very end of the lecture. The hop map is this beautiful thing, um, but one of the main things is that take any P, Q, in points in S2, their pre-images in S3, will be linked, and in fact, it's called the Hopf link. Um, they'll exactly be this kind of simplest kind of link. I always used to wonder why I was called the Hopf link. Hopf is a very good mathematician and that's a very stupid link, but in the Hopf map, the pre-image of any two points gives a Hopf link. So for example, the um, one, one pre-image, depending on you know, how you put coordinates and everything, but um, will be the unit circle, in, in, in uh, R2 inside of R3, inside of S3, which is R3 union point of infinity. And another is the Z axis. So those happen to be, if you choose the right P and Q in C hat, you get the unit circle and the Z axis. Doesn't seem like a circle, but again, I've got a point in infinity that that includes. So what happens if, if suppose, well, just any homotopy starting at eta, Actually, I'll just say eta to constant map. I'm going to look at the pre images of P and Q. And I'm going to assume my constant value isn't P or Q. So here in this S3, I get one of these hop links. Here I've got empty set. Both of those are not in it. Um, and well, I mean, the fact that this circle can kind of cap off or whatever would be fine. It, it can be even more exotic. Maybe this red thing, um, there's some topology and it's actually the boundary of a, of a torus. The key though is that you argue that this, this capping off can't happen because the red and the blue, let's again, the blue is the pre-image of P The red is the pre-image of Q. And their um, intersection would be simultaneously a point that goes to P and Q, which is nonsense, okay? So, so they can't have an intersection and what you prove topologically is that that's impossible because the, the left-hand sides um, are linked. So Hopf gave a proof that actually filled in this intuition with, with some sort of linking and intersection ideas. But Whitehead in 1947 gave an alternative proof that, that you can't um, uh, homotop the Hopf map to a constant map. And he used Durham theory. 
Um, so let me give you that modern uh, modern retelling. So Whitehead's proof uses a Durham integral. And I'll give you the modern Durham account. And this is this is um, some of these. Some of the attended audience will will know this is this appears in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences in 1947. This is cited a lot more in the physics literature because these integrals they seem to have to do with magnetism in various ways. Okay, so but here's again my modern Durham account. That's the whole payoff for our work so far. So buckle up. So we're gonna start with some map from S3 to S2. I'm gonna fix a form um, on S2. So it's a two form. Um, and, and again, you might imagine that, uh, that from what I've been saying, I might sometimes want to think of that as a volume form. I might sometimes want to think of that as a concentrated form. It helps to have that flexibility to think about it from all these different perspectives. So um, let's pull back omega. And the first thing I claim is that that is itself closed. And the reason is, well, one thing you prove is that this exterior differential um, commutes with pullback. Um, and, and I mean, yeah, uh, we haven't gone through that, but this will motivate you to go through those kinds of properties if you want to do this fully properly. But d omega is a two form on S2. There are no three forms on S2 for its derivative to be other than zero. So, um, and so that implies, and the other thing is that, um, Moreover, the second Durham cohomology of the three sphere equals zero. So closed, which means you have zero derivative implies exact, which means you have an antiderivative. So I'm gonna just call that D inverse F upper star omega, and maybe I'll put it in a big warning that this is a choice. There is an antiderivative. Um, it's unlike on the, the real line, there can be all sorts. Remember, a D inverse, for example, for linking number involved any choice of disk um, of the first, uh, of the first uh, component of the link. So there's a lot of those. Um, so even though I write this as a thing, it's really many possible things and everything I write about it should be true for every one of those. So it can get you a little in a little trouble, but, but again, this is, it's the right way from my perspective to talk about things here. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this D inverse F upper star omega, and I'm going to wedge it with F upper star omega itself. This is a one form now on S3. This is a two form. And I'm gonna integrate it over S3. I can also, by the way, if you don't like, if you don't wanna be so environmentally conscious and reuse your omega, um, you could also take two different forms, one to pull back and differentiate and the other to, pull back and wedge with what you got when you anti-differentiate it. So, um, so what do you notice that is if, um, if omega one is tau P and omega two is tau Q, this is the linking number of um, the pre-images of P and Q. I guess that was a 
sorry, one property that I didn't put of, of tome forms is that the tone that you can, when you pull back a tome form, it's the same as taking, you get a tome form for the pre-image of your submanifold. So that's a good hint that we're not at a proof yet, but this is, you know, Hopps, Hopps says that this is an interesting map, his Hopf map, because these pre-images are linked. Now we're, we're, we're producing an integral, which is a, a linking number if, if we make the right choices. And this is for any map. So what you then have to do is you wanna prove, so, so claim these integrals are homotopy invariant. or homotopies of F. Okay, so um, let H be a map, um, which interpolates between some F and some G. And we're gonna consider the integral over S3 cross I of D of this form. But now I'm gonna use H instead of F. Well, I can compute it in two ways. By Stokes theorem, the integral of D of some form over um, a manifold with a boundary is the integral over its boundary, which is just S3 cross zero and S3 cross one of, um, well, I'm gonna take the form and I'm gonna restrict it. And H upper star is the same as F upper star. So I'm gonna get D inverse F upper star omega when, when I'm at the T equals zero end wedge F upper star omega. Um, and really I should maybe say minus um, integral of D inverse G upper star omega wedge G upper star omega. So this is the difference of this. What I wanna show is invariant on both ends. So, well, we wanna show that the difference is zero, but now what we, we've used Stokes there, let's just calculate D of this, is equal to, there's a Leibniz rule. D of D inverse, well, I chose D inverse to be something whose D is, is that. So I've got H upper star omega wedge, H upper star omega. Um, and that's gonna be um, integral over S3 cross I of H upper star omega wedge omega, but omega would be a, a uh, uh, omega is a two form on S2, omega wedge omega is a four form on S2. So that's zero. Um, but then the other thing, when I take D not of the D inverse term, but I would have plus D inverse H upper star omega um, wedge D H upper star omega, but that's zero because again, D of H upper star is H upper star of D and D omega is a three form in S2 and it's zero, phew, okay. Um, I should also say here that um, one other step, it's really important that, that this D inverse exists in the first place, but S3 cross I has the same Durham cohomology in fact as S3. So um, there also is uh, uh, such a uh, such a D inverse, just as there was, was for S three itself. Okay, phew. Um, that's used all these basic properties of Durham theory sort of come through and show that this invariant, which is telling us about well, if if omega is a is a single sort of a really concentrated form. It's telling us about the linking of these pre-images. Remember at the beginning of this lecture, I said, well, any other form I can think of 
as a sum of these locally supported forms, in which case it's going to be the sum of those linking numbers, um, this shows that that's, that's an invariant using basic Durham theory. Um, an exercise would be to connect this then with the explicit formulae given for, um, for when omega is, say, the standard two form on S2 that, um, let me write it down. Uh, and I, I don't think I've even seen this. I'm not sure how good an exercise it is, but choose omega equals, you know, our x dx dz plus y dz dx plus z dy dx. over x squared plus y squared plus z squared to the three halves. Take that form on S2. On S2, you would actually, this is equal to one, so don't worry about the denominator. Um, um, but yeah, this would give you some explicit integral that you could write down, which I think is maybe more what Whitehead did. Um, let me finally reflect just take the opportunity to talk about my own work a little bit. Notice here how important it is that omega wedge omega in this case, or omega one wedge omega two, if we had two of those, is zero, right? That's a key step. If, if omega wedge omega isn't zero, this is not an invariant. There's going to be a correction term. Um, this... Omega wedge omega is is this is what we call a equal zero as a relation in Durham cohomology, and this whole argument shows that in this case this relation in Durham cohomology gives rise to an interesting homotopy invariant, an invariant that isn't just what I told you about last time, what Durham what Durham invariants are immediately born to give you, which are homotopy invariants by pulling back and integrating. This is a more subtle one that you can get using some antiderivatives as well as wedge products. Um, some of my biggest work, so to speak, is to show that this, this structure happens in general for any manifolds of any dimension, um, any manifold of any dimension, spheres mapping into those, you get a complete set of homotopy invariants, at least rationally, at least up to sort of a self-multiplication. Um, you get a complete set of invariants if you build from things like omega wedge omega equals zero or maybe omega cubed plus omega wedge tau plus tau wedge sigma squared equals zero. Anytime you have some equation, extra equation that holds in Durham cohomology, this is extra in for, because omega is a two form. If it were a one form, omega wedge omega would be zero for free. Not a big deal. You don't get a homotopy invariant. There are no interesting maps from like S2 to S1. But anytime you get an extra relationship between these Durham classes, you can make a homotopy invariant from that. And uh, a substantial research line that I'm working on to this day at the level of group theory of all things is, is to, to, to explicitly uh, dig into that relationship between uh, Durham cohomology and these relations in the cohomology ring on the one hand and homotopy invariance on the other. So uh, that's why I, among very few mathematicians, have cited Whitehead's paper uh, making me a minority in that population of mostly physicists. All right. Well, thank you for uh, being with me through this mini course. See some of you and discuss its uh, further uh, applications soon. And um, 